I uh, will just great. I uh, will just uh get it going and um so yeah, welcome everyone. Um again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us um this morning, evening, uh wherever you're joining us. I uh, really appreciate you all joining us. Uh, my name is Francis. My name is Francis Odom. Um, I've I've my throughout my career I've worked in from venture capital to product management across the technology stack. And um, over the last year, I've launched my own cybersecurity research firm called the Software Analyst, where I do a lot of cybersecurity research, provide consulting as well as uh, provide boot camp um, opportunities and training for cybersecurity professionals. Um, and so as part of my, uh, obviously I've written a lot, done a lot of research and working to power out the networks over the last few years, which many of them has fortunately been recognized by Nikesh Arora, as well as leaders that follow out the networks. And so with lots of the knowledge we've built over the last year, we've, um, and I'll, I'll let Paul introduce himself shortly, um, we felt that wanted to help investors as well as operators interpret what just happened um, over the last earnings call. So maybe Cole, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Hey, I'm Cole Rollins. Uh, I write Strategy of Security, which is a publication about the business and strategy of cybersecurity. Um, I also have a boutique consulting practice that goes along with that, where I work with ranging from like late stage growth startups to a couple early stage clients, um, and also uh, an investment bank called Momentum Cyber, uh, with some consulting on like the business side of the industry. So kind of both the analyst and then uh, in the game, so to speak. Um, before that, I worked at PwC for just over a decade as a director in the cybersecurity and privacy practice. So I have quite a bit of experience uh, working kind of end to end with enterprise clients through, you know, all the way at the beginning of the procurement process through implementation and ongoing operations. And so we'll speak to some of that today as well. Amazing, amazing, excited for this. So without further ado, our agenda for this conversation is the first 45 minutes, uh, we're just going to go over some of the key major points out of the earnings call. So some of those key major points were we're going to really explain, obviously, why the stock is down over 30 percent. The core reasons for that, we're going to go over platformization. We're going to explain platformization versus then the consolidation. We're going to go over billings and just giving people a fundamental understanding of how billings work um, and exactly how this specifically affecting Palo Alto networks. And then at the very end, we're actually going to talk about the strategy differences between Microsoft and CrowdStrike and even maybe Zscaler and how each of their strategy actually differs from the, this new approach that Palo Alto is actually taking. So those are some of the major points and we're going to cover each of these in just about 40 minutes. And then at the very end of that, we're going to have a Q&A where we really hope to have all of your questions. Uh, so I'm going to make the chat active in a few moments here, but feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and then at the very end, at, at the end of our 40 to just about 40 minutes, uh, we're going to go over each of those um, Q&A and like we'll spend as much time really having a conversation with everyone. Uh, but yeah, anything else, Cole, you wanted to add? No, I think we're good to go. Perfect. And then just for everyone's um, purposes, all of this would be recorded. So if, if you don't, you don't have to worry about having to get the recording. Uh, we're going to send the recording right after this is done. Um, and um, yes, and you could always refer back to our blogs where we're actually going to share a deep, deep dive or research report, just interpreting all of all the digesting and just everything we've just talked about on this call, as well as additional points we're going to add in those reports. So, OK, amazing. So um, our very first question, obviously, maybe I'll, I'll put this to Cole and we'll kind of go back and forth. And this is, this morning, obviously, Palo Alto Networks, the stock is down over 30%. We definitely didn't predict this. I think that's one thing. We definitely didn't predict this. I think me and Cole, we've we've written a lot about Palo Alto Networks and even both of our work, both of our research has been shared by the CEO and lots of the leadership team internally. Um, and we just felt like, you know what, we just wanted to, have a debrief to yeah. use Palo Alto Networks to really as an emblematic um, symbol of a lot of the trends and thematics that are happening within the larger cybersecurity industry. And um, so anyways, that was originally the goal, but obviously now it's down 30%. And I know lots of people have lots of questions. So maybe Cole, what are the core fundamental reasons why the stock is down 
and how we might find its way back to become a $100 billion company. Yeah, this isn't exactly the conversation we were expecting to have today, but in some ways, I think it's actually a more interesting one. Like I've, I've settled on this a bit since listening to the earnings call live yesterday afternoon, and I think it will end up being a more fruitful conversation, um, you know, in this turbulence opposed to another one where we just, you know, slam dunked it and had another awesome quarter. You know, I, I think I'll let Francis talk more about the financial part of it, but I mean, I, I think fundamentally a few things. Anytime Wall Street sees earnings guidance revives downwards, that's obviously a bad sign, um, or at least it's taken as a bad sign. And so that's that's the immediate snap reaction you've seen between the earnings announcement yesterday and this morning, which has led to whatever, call it a 25% decline. Um, I, I think within that, if we were to unpack it a bit, there's a bit of confusion around like the abrupt per per perception of an abrupt announcement around the strategy shift for billings. And so that's why we want to spend some time talking about that. It's, it's, it's actually a very nuanced topic and some of the misunderstanding or openness to interpret the program is what's leading to the earning there what's leading to the stock decline and, and and in a way i like i posted this morning i think it's a bit over exaggerated if we're to take a step back and look at this like over the long run and, and we'll explain why um the the last thing i would say is you know there was there was a clear finger to point at their federal program where there was a big program um that where they, they were expecting it to come through and it didn't and so you know they were immediately working out of a hole on the quarter because of that. And it's expected to go, you know, it's, it's expected to be a long-term thing. And so, um, I, you know, I think, I think those are the main reasons that we're looking at here in the near term, but we hope to unpack that a lot more. Like Francis, what else would you add there? Yeah, no, 100%. I think fundamentally investors have a cause to react. And obviously there's a dramatic slowdown in revenue, especially the billions growth, which is going to be going from just about 11% or so to about 4% next quarter. Um, obviously, this is a significant takedown of what they initially guided to in, in August and even as of last quarter. So there's a slowdown in revenue growth and billions growth over the next couple of quarters. Um, and obviously, a lot of that comes down to this strategy shift around platformization and obviously allow customers to try out um, products for free, which we're going to actually talk about briefly. So fundamentally, growth is going to slow down over the short term. And then number two, um, they're experiencing lots of headwinds from a federal program. So apparently, we, didn't, we don't have as much details about this, but there was a federal program um, that Palo Alto had banked on getting. It, it was a significant large project, a large contract. Um, that they were expected to actually nail down, and that would have actually contributed to to the billions growth and, and revenue growth over the short term. But unfortunately, that program apparently fell through, and it makes up a significant portion of um a lot of um billions growth. So I think the federal program that just fell through, that in it of itself has just magnified the whole problem over the short term. And so yes, yeah, so revenue billions growth is going to slow down and a breakdown in some of the federal problems. And this is very important for people to realize the federal government, government contracts make up a huge, it's actually Palo Alto's largest vertical um, out of all industries. So Palo Alto relies very heavily on government revenues to actually drive the business. And so this taking a hit, especially together with an announcement that of this new strategy shift, that's going to obviously affect lots of contracts over the short term. Um, you could see why there is weakness um, in the stock today and probably for the next couple months or maybe even a couple quarters, I'd imagine, because investors need to kind of wrap around their heads around this, especially even the valuation, because especially coming into this quarter, the stock had already um, was extremely way above its skis. So, okay, cool. I think we've kind of covered those. So maybe let's go into platformization. Um, so I'm going to put in the Q&A here for everyone. Cole, actually, it's funny, just in August last year, or actually last time when Alato had their um, investor day at the at the annual um, investor day, um, 
co-wrote the really brilliant article on just the audacious future um, of a lot of networks. And in that article, Paul went in depth into what platformization actually means. And like the differences between that versus best of breed or vendor consolidation or consolidation a whole bunch of products. And Nikesh actually shared that research because Nikesh fully agreed. So maybe Paul um, explain at the very fundamental level What's what's platformization and how does that even differ from say consolidation? And then we could kind of um, cover some of what was announced yesterday. Yeah, I think this is pretty fundamental to understanding both the long-term strategy of Palo Alto Networks as well as like exactly what's going on here. And so that's why we're starting with a quick discussion about platformization versus just going straight into the billings. Because like, if you're not solid on platformization, the billings context doesn't really make a lot of sense without that background. So that's that's why we're starting here. You, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance here. I think the way to explain it is consolidation is more about, it, it's more of a financially motivated move, right? Where when you're in an industry segment, like backups is a good example. Palo Alto Networks doesn't play there, but it's a good case study recently, right? Like there were a couple big companies that consolidated, they merged in a multi-billion dollar deal for market share. There wasn't a lot of differentiation on the product side. It was really about, can we put two companies together and gain market share and cost efficiency from an operation standpoint by doing that? Like that's kind of fundamentally what consolidation is typically about. There's not really a major driver on the financial side, nor is there really a huge driver from like customers other than maybe wanting to work with fewer vendors. On platformization, the big idea behind that is Palo Alto Networks can produce multiple platforms or platforms with multiple products within them that would typically be point products and customers would get both a better financial outcome and a better operational outcome as in better use of the product from buying the platform either in, in its entirety or significant parts of it. That's the big idea behind what Palo Alto Networks is trying to do is actually make everything work better together. Absolutely, 100%. I do agree. And one very key point you had actually mentioned in one of in, in this article that you actually wrote about optimization versus consolidation is consolidation is usually always cost driven um, and it's a lot more focused on what are the individual products that I need to maybe remove or, or like maybe I need to find a way to actually aggregate some of them as opposed to platformization rather than it being more cost driven and cost saving driven as opposed to like how many vendors can I actually rip apart. Platformization is actually more value driven. It's more about how could I get existing value from my existing solutions. And I think, for example, I think how often they have this really good example of what they're doing with even network security, for example. In the past, you would have maybe bought a firewall from a vendor like C4Tnet, for example. You might have bought like your OT security operational technology from say like an Amis or a, a, a different type of vendor. And But now in this case, it's like, you know what, if you just run your net, your like, so in, and in the world of consolidation, buying those two individual vendors you'd maybe have to negotiate or like find a way in which you could actually save cost on each of those but now with this new pitch of optimization it's all about with one vendor if you actually centralize your whole network for example on palo alto networks i could actually just help you have your firewall appliances or like your software driven firewalls virtual firewalls as well as help you with OT security and like you have all of this considering on the one network and the total value of that over the long term obviously you, you're getting better bang for your buck as opposed to buying each of the separate products so completely agree um completely agree with you um what are the, what are the, there's, I mean, a, the there's a metaphor here that's kind of still like a work in progress thought for me that i wanted to share i I think that you could roughly, not exactly, but roughly compare the Palo Alto Networks platformization idea to the Costco business model. Again, not a direct translation, but I think there are relevant comparisons. And what I mean by that is with Costco, 
you're paying a subscription and what you're getting from a product standpoint is you kind of can trust Costco to procure and sell the top one, two or three products in any given category for what they sell. Right. And in a way, that's what Palo Alto Networks is doing. Right. Like if you look at any of the MA that they've done, they're not buying like some cheap product out there that nobody has heard of. And then hoping that just by putting it in the, into the Palo Alto Network sales machine, it's going to go like they've explicitly stated and proven through the course of, you know, 10 plus acquisitions that they're buying like the top one, two or three technology in a market at a relatively early scale, but at a premium, Talon being one example in the enterprise browser space. And then they're incorporating that into the overall platform, right? So what that means is anybody who's on the buying end of Palo Alto Networks, any customer kind of knows that they're going to do the diligence for them. And they're going to, their portfolio is going to include the top products that are out there instead of the customer having to do that diligence themselves. 100%. And that's why they have the Gartner recognitions for each of each of the individual product modules for each of those major platforms. They have the Gartner's, the Forrester recognitions, G25. Uh, so just giving validation that a lot of these products are actually best of breed. And so you're not actually sacrificing a best of breed by actually standardizing or going, joining their entire platform. I think that makes a lot of sense. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the why behind this platformization strategy. Like, let's talk about from a system integrator's perspective and like the friction, like because many people think it's that very easy to actually consolidate a whole bunch of vendors and standardize. I think it's so important for people to understand like this is fundamentally a really difficult problem. Like there are lots of very high switching costs, especially if you're like in a legacy vendor. And I think we need to help people on the, on the cover that like a lot of the strategies about helping customers easily transition out of like old vendors into a new one. So do you, do you maybe want to touch briefly on like why the why behind this platformization and why this whole, this makes such you know, like the whole brother um, ecosystem of this? Yeah, let's try to kind of quickly cover both sides of that. Like there's a why on the buyer side and then there's like a why this matters for the Palo Alto Networks side. On the, on the buyer side, right, right, remember that Palo Alto Network's client base or customer base is heavily skewed towards the global 2000. So in other words, it's like the biggest 2000 companies and organizations in the world, um, if you throw federal in there as well. So the process of like the sales process of getting an enterprise that large to decide to replace a product they already have with another product is a monumental effort. Like it's almost impossible to do it. And I I've suffered this many, many, many times personally. <laughs> it's, seen it. it, it's really, it's really hard. And we're just talking about like, like one product, right? And I, I think that Nikesh and Deepak both articulated it pretty well. The two main risks from a client, a customer perspective are there's an execution risk like literally just making the change from one firewall product or CASB product or name, you know, name or SASE or name your product, it doesn't matter. Making the change from one product to another carries a significant amount of risk. Like you hear nightmares about failed implementations all the time and vendors getting kicked out and never wanting to work with each other again. Like it's, it's very problematic. It's very hard to make changes and they're expensive because they take a lot of time and they take, they generally take system implementation, their systems integrator fees, professional services fees to go along with that. They're multi-million dollar projects. So there's a significant amount of execution risk. On the flip side, there's also a lot of financial risk because even if you're talking about replacing one product, it's really expensive to operate two licenses at the same time, right? Like it's not as simple, a replacement is not as simple as, oh, I'm just going to let my contract with vendor A expire my contract with Palo Alto Networks is going to start immediately after that and I'll be up and running. Like there's a period of overlap, sometimes years required to get to wind down one vendor and ramp up Palo Alto Networks. And so the whole time that you're in that transition period, you're paying both licenses and that's very expensive. So the, 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 the friction around that entire process is what makes customers never want to switch in the first place. Mm -hmm. Why that matters for Palo Alto Networks, you know, they're they're like exponentially more complicated in this process because they're selling a platform. They're not trying to displace, in a perfect world, they're not trying to displace one product. They are trying to displace 
multiple products, right? And so if it's already complex to, to get one switched out, it's borderline impossible to get multiple switched out. And so the brilliance behind this whole strategy, it's it's really like a creative financial incentive when you when you boil it down, right? Like the brilliance behind this entire strategy is you're taking all of almost all of the execution risk away and almost all the financial risk away to a point where then a customer can say, okay, all right, it like that that, that friction is gone. Now it makes sense for me to be able to switch. And why that matters for Palo Alto Networks is the worst thing that's going to happen to them is they take a short-term billings hit. It's not a discount. It's not premium. It's like, I'll only give you this program if you commit to a three to five year term. And then once they have that, they've got an ongoing customer and they collect all the revenue, right? So if that if that sale never happens, they get none of it. And so it's way better to defer revenue than it is to not get revenue in the first place. I think you should double click on that point that this is not a free trial. Like every, I think a lot of people have that misconception that like kind of how you, you see with many of the SaaS product or bottoms up product where it's like free trial, freemium type product. There is a little bit of this. However, a lot of these customers are getting into contractual agreements. And in most of these cases, the premise is just deferred. But as the case people said, the exit area R is eventually going to be the same. The whole point is you're just deferring down that payment. You're not paying it off front and you're paying that down the road. I don't know if you want to maybe dive deep a little bit more into that, um, because I think that's such a fundamental point for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's driving a lot of, that misconception is driving a lot of the confusion. And I mean, it's not the only reason the stock is down, but it's a contributing factor. And I think part of it is kind of addressing the comment that that Nipin Gupta left. Like, it, it's A, it's a pretty abrupt change in strategy. I mean, I understand the timing questions around that. But I think like the boldness and in a way, like, like dare I even say innovation in a financial context is just different for people. Like, I don't know, I, I can't think of any other large cybersecurity companies that are offering these kinds of programs, right? And so like to see these kind of terms come out for the first time is a little bit jarring for people because it's not something that we're used to in the sales and buying cycle in this industry, right? So in that sense, it actually is it actually is pretty disruptive. And I can see where you fall into like old paradigms of like, oh, well, this is a discount or, oh, this is a trial or whatever, right? Like it's it's not that. It's just extended payment terms to get people to switch over. Like I tried to come up with a way to explain this. And I think the most tangible way that I can come up with that's relatable for people is like buying a house. So I bought a new house or my family bought a new house a couple years ago. And, you know, the intent for us was to stay here for like 20 years. It was supposed to be a long-term place that we could raise our kids, right? It wasn't perfect. There was definitely, you know, it's a 20-year-old house. It's like buying a 20-year-old sim in my sock, right? Like there was a lot of work that I had to do on top of the purchase price to be able to get it to a point where we wanted it. And it's still not perfect. Like there are constraints of how the, you know, the town home was built and things that I would still really ideally don't like about it, right? It's really not that different for somebody who's replacing a sock, right? Like, or, or modernizing their sock or modernizing some other piece of tech. Like they're just living with the legacy vendor because they don't really love it, right? What's what what flips this model on its head using our real estate metaphor is let's say that a realtor came to you or me or whoever owns the house. I'm not planning on moving and said, hey, look, Cole, I've got this new property that we're building. It's right down the street. It's got everything you need. It fixes a lot of problems that you want. I'm going to let you move into that without paying for it until you sell your house on the market. Like you'll get the move, you, you, you'll get the move taken care of, you'll get your family settled, like everything will be in tip top shape and your house is gonna be gone. It doesn't even matter that the real estate market is slower. Like that's the kind of thing that it would take for somebody like me at this place in my life to move. I don't wanna move, but if I'm incentivized like that, like they took away my risk, they took away my execution risk and they took away my financial risk of having to pay two mortgages. That's exactly what's happening here at an enterprise software level. So I don't know if it's a totally fair comparison, but it's it's the best complex transaction that I can come up with that is relevant in like most of our personal lives. 100%. No, I think that that execution risk is such a fundamental thing 
Um, and, and you need to lessen that risk to allow customers um, make that transition easy. Um, as well as obviously you have to, customers really have to believe in your product. You have to really fundamentally believe the product is the right product uh, for you to make that transition. So not ask you, maybe let's briefly talk about the downside. So we've talked about the bull case and like how we see this working out, but let's also think about how this might not actually work out and, and what could be some of the risk factors um to this I and mean, quite frankly let's just assess that for a bit <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i think it i i think that there's a delicate balance that has to happen here between you know the upside and the incentives of the financial program versus like the actual product quality and innovation that happens within the platform right like i think the only way that this cycle of you know Pro financial programs and product innovation like really works is if customers actually want the product. <laughs> and I, and I, I think that that's part of what makes it defensible. Like I, I found myself questioning like, okay, is this financial program defensible, right? Like it, relatively speaking, like any large company has the financial means that they could offer something similar, just copy the program and then you're sort of back to netting out, right? So it's not really a differentiator anymore. I think what makes it differentiating is like if you don't have the product that goes with it and nobody wants that product, then the financial part of it doesn't really matter. Like I'm not going to finance something that I don't really want to buy. Right. But I think if you do have a product that people want or a platform that people want it, then it, that like then it becomes a lot more the, the incentive of, oh, I can help you pay for this becomes a lot more realistic because in a way they're kind of buying something that they can't afford, or at least they are using financial flexibility that they're being offered to buy something that they may not buy otherwise. And so I think I think like that whole dynamic is really important is is like the product innovation has to be able to keep up with it. And that's where like their MA strategy, their strategy with you know XIM, their AI strategy, like all of the different components that are platform really matter because if their product falters, I, I don't think that this idea works. Exactly. No, if if they let up in any any of those areas, because let's just say Nestle SASE, for example, where quite frankly Zscaler is number one within SASE, they're the leading player and obviously they have a phenomenal product. Oh, with like Nextscope, for example, that's an area and where there's a lot of really lots of pricing. There's a lot of aggressive pricing that happens there. I think that's one area where like, if they do let up in any case, or Zscaler or Nescope just has a significant product feature that's like outweighs a lot more of Palo Alto's network um, features. I think that's a situation where even though you offer customers this incentive to switch, um, customers are just gonna like, no, this is a product that we really like and it works well for us and we're not gonna do it. And I think one little downside too is like, obviously they've made this strategy known and it's really out there. And I think lots of competition who might have like potential contract renewals up for due and know they might have to go into a POC, for example, I know that, hey, Palo Alto might wanna actually use the strategy to actually wind down my customer over, I think you're going to see a lot of pricing work. I think out of, you're going to see a lot of pricing work where Zscaler might consider like, do we want to like discount some of our product to like fend off um, or something that you might find. So I think there's going to be a lot of so-called bloodbath on, on, on the market, both from the pricing side as well as from the product side. And I think obviously longer sales cycles, I think you, you kind of touched about this long, this is going to be, you're going to have significant longer sales cycle. And um, obviously there's a lot more inherent risk that do come with some of those. Um, and yeah, any last point you want DJ to- DJ is getting at something pretty important here that I think is a nice way to like tie up this topic. So the, the essence of the question is like, okay, I understand platformization. Like how do you explain the near-term financial hit, right? And I don't know if I'm gonna entirely address the question, but I think there's like a broader implication to all of it. Like, I think the- the challenging part about a, about this platformization strategy is it's you know is a nuance sure I mean we spent some time explaining at the beginning because not everybody understands it but like it, it I would say relatively speaking once it clicks it's a platformization strategy is easy to understand right where we get into like financial difficulty is when that hits implementation right and I'll I'll start implementation at like the beginning of the sales cycle right like let's not even talk about like a fully implemented product right. 
I think the challenge, that, and this is a weakness potentially, or at least something that Paolo needs to address in this platformization strategy, is it's it's hard to sell a platform. Like you're talking about displacing multiple products. It's really complicated with the biggest buyers in the world, right? And so I think that's where you, that, you know, that could be a factor in some of the near-term slowdown. I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking off, you know, I, I don't know this. I'm just speculating here, but like they may have seen a slowdown or of, of, of sales coming at the, at, you know, at the platform level, right? Like they, like it might just be taking longer for them to get deals through the finish line. Right. And, and, or, or at least they suspect that that could happen once they're through the pipeline that they're in, because remember, we're talking about a multi-year strategy here. So what do they have to do? Like, like if I'm Nikesh, I have to get that unstuck. Like I have to do something to get that engine going again because I can't have sales tank worse or I can't have this like like spread out further, right? So what do you yeah. do? You put a pricing program in place that's going to incentivize some of this to happen sooner or at least at a more even level. And then that's going to that's gonna keep, you know, my my deal flow moving and my revenue. Really right. so I, I think that's like a broad explanation of how you explain like any near term financial hit. I mean, obviously, there's a collections piece of it. Like you're just you're collecting money later instead of now. So that's that explains like a billings difference, you know, but but I think like fundamentally, that's really what it's about is like getting the you know, keeping the sales process moving and, and getting customers to maybe make decisions on on a platform buy that they might not have made until later. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, they did, did say this and they've been consistent about this over the last two quarters. And the fact that there's still macro risk out there, customers are still, obviously, I mean, budgets are increasing generally for security, but obviously there's still this whole issue of longer sales cycles. There's still some issues around firewall refresh cycles, but there is risk out there and customers that obviously with interest rates where they are, customers are not willing to put as much money down. So this has already been some of the billions issues that have actually been like major themes on previous earnings call and obviously got significantly much more exaggerated on here. But what was more impressive too was their free cash flow guidance was relatively, they maintained that free cash flow guidance despite this whole heat that this whole billions program uh, might have. And so I, I think that's very interesting that they were still able to manage their cost levels despite them taking this hit to customers. And again, I think we talked about this. You need to be really strong on your balance sheet to be able to make a lot of these um um a lot of these things that they have going on. One last thing to just maybe emphasize too is there is this federal problem, this contract that they lost or this contract that didn't go through with the federal government, um, that's still a major issue. Right? I think we also need to remember like that's a major hit to their existing revenues right now. And I, I I hope they may be going into more detail, but maybe there's probably not just more detail, just because this is a contract they didn't lose. But that's a fundamental problem that is affecting them. And I think we should just be aware of that. That's why growth is going to be significantly slower. And like they need some of these new features to help them smoothing out the whole impact. Okay, good. In the last 10 minutes here, before we dive into QA, maybe let's just talk about strategy differences between like Palo Alto networks relative to say Microsoft or CrowdStrike and like even some of some of the differences that we've noticed like maybe we could start in terms of like the go-to market so I think me and Cole we've, we've kind of talked about this that on a high level lots of people think oh Palo Alto like because Palo Alto obviously Palo, I think CrowdStrike is down today obviously because of the impact but like whenever we think about CrowdStrike versus um a lot of networks, obviously, they were going after the same strategy of consolidation, although relatively in very different ways. Do you want to maybe break that down? Uh, and then I'm happy to chime in. Maybe we could start with both the market and some of the other differences in which we see between both players. Yeah, I think like a pretty important distinction is Palo Alto Networks is trying to sell as much security software as they can. Like they offer products in four of the five major estates, excluding identity in, in security, right? So they're trying to sell as much security software as they can to as many global 2000, so very large enterprise size organizations as they can. So the, in other words, they're trying to sell a lot to a little, right? CrowdStrike is a little more balanced and a little more depth 
where, you know, yes, they have a lot of modules in their product portfolio, some of which overlap with Palo Alto Networks and some of them don't, right? But they sell all the way from enterprise down to mid-market to SMBs and, you know, kind of like around the Super Bowl commercial, it's rumored that they may even be going to like the smallest businesses and maybe even as far as like the consumer level someday, right? So they're, they're, they're a little deeper slice of the market where they're selling a decent product portfolio to a lot of customers at all different segments where Palo Alto Networks is really, really heavily focused on the biggest companies in the world. 100%. Absolutely. I think that's a huge one Um, where a lot of like, especially like, so one product, we could even talk about it from product differences because like, a lot of that drives in which your go-to-market is, is, for example, a network security and a network firewall, like obviously having the whole infrastructure to actually like manufacture and produce those from hardware firewalls all the way to like software um, firewalls and VMs. A lot of those... CrowdStrike has nothing of that. They're not even present at the very network layer of an enterprise, not to even talk about SASE or any of those companies. So that's like a really significant product difference whereby um, CrowdStrike has an EDR, where an EDR is very applicable for the largest enterprise all the way to an SMB. Meanwhile, you would never really have uh, a network or a network security or SASE platform that is quite applicable um, for say an SMB or, or a really small um, SMB. So I think there's a major product difference there. Um, and a lot of that drives in which the go-to-market and the whole execution and, um, and, and business strategy. I think that's one at the network layer versus EDR. I think this whole question of SIM replacement is very interesting. And obviously Palo Alto is going really aggressive. This is where they talked about their AI, their AI strategy. And probably maybe make this differentiation for people to know whenever Palo Alto, at least right now, talks about their AI strategy, none of this has to do with like a co-pilot or like an LLM-like um, type of product. I mean, they have that on the roadmap and that eventually would be built into it. But at the moment, a lot of their AI strategy, and yesterday they give us a stat saying that they're generating over 100 million in ARR um, from AI security. A lot of this, at least the way we understand it at the moment, comes from their XIM, um, their XIM product at, at the moment, which is a combination of SIM, Thor, um, EDR, XBR, um, and then external attack surface management. Sorry if we're mentioning terminologies for, for non-cyber people, but uh, we have a bootcamp that, that maybe explains a little bit about this, but they're combining a lot of this product into one, which is called XIM, and that's what allows them um, to generate and you could, part of this uses AI, but this is not a co-pilot or an LLM-like type of product feature. So I think that's a very important differentiation for people to notice. And then another important point too is just how many vendors there are displacing um, at the SIM market. They talked about displacing about 19 different SIM um, providers, like obviously, and when we mean that word SIM, obviously they don't just mean Splunk, but there's like other platforms like detection engineering or like security analytics vendors out there. And I thought that was a very, very important stat um, to see where this, um, one of their key product strategy. Meanwhile, CrowdStrike does have a SIM-like type of product, but it's definitely not even as mature as this. Um, did you want to also talk about any other differences to, to like the Cisco's of the world or even Microsoft's bundling strategy as well too? Yeah, I mean, I think I, kind of maybe one point on like an AI question that was dropped in here that's relevant is, I, you know, I, I would say that the AI capabilities coming to fruition is like a fairly like one of the most major, if not the most major point to the success or lack, the, the future success or lack thereof of their platformization strategy. Like, like AI working, especially in the underlying components of Cortex and the SOC really matters a lot 
as a differentiator. <laughs> like that, that the, one of the big ideas of the entire platform from a technical perspective is that like the data is structured better and in a way that lends itself well to applying AI on top of that, where legacy sims that were built, you know, really before the widespread usage of AI aren't really set up as well for that. Like that's a very critical argument. So agree or disagree, like that that's a lot of their success hinges on that. And so I think, you know, I, I think it's I think it's pretty important. Uh, and and one kind of hook to leave that we, I won't go into because it's a it's a rabbit hole. But like Nikesh has talked a lot in the past about the idea of precision AI and security, and like you know what like what that means in a distinction between that and LLMs is like you've got to think of precision AI a bit more like self driving cars, right? Like you can't be wrong because the cars crash. So the accuracy around the use of AI matters a lot more and, and therefore the timeline of like the development and, and the evolution of the technology is longer because it takes more data and more time to get it to be precise to a point that it's safe to use. It's kind of the same idea in security. Like, are there cases where you could use LLMs? Like, of course, and they've, you know, they've talked about that and we've seen some examples in the wild now, but like, Ultimately, it, 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 you know, that side of the house, like the sock side of the house, the accuracy does matter a lot. And so it's going to take a little bit longer for, longer for that to happen. But when it does, it's probably going to make a lot bigger difference. Like, so I, I think that that's a pretty important distinction on the product side. Yes, that, that's, that's a huge one. That's a huge one. Cool. Um, and then any final, maybe one, maybe one final summary, and then we'll kind of go into the Q&A and like go over some of the points. And again, there are lots more points we could have actually covered, but I think for the sake of time and, and the Zoom hiccup we had, we've just had to shorten a little bit some of our points. Again, we're going to elaborate on many of these points within a deep dive that we have to follow after this, as well as the recording. But I think one major thing I'll just mention lastly with Microsoft's bundling strategy, because a huge part of this whole platformization comes down to um very similar to what Microsoft has done successfully with the E5 and the E8 um, licensing. A lot of Microsoft's success in bundling a lot of this product has been more successful SMBs um, and like mid tier to lower tier of the market, especially for, for really like customers who are not able to spend as much um, on security. You're able to just buy a license with Microsoft and easily roll out some of the security products. Meanwhile, lots of Palo Alto's bundling strategies but it's more, it's really a platform of a platform in of itself in the sense that a lot of this is more bundling for, for the largest enterprise. It's not as easy, like Microsoft's one is significantly easier because it's like you could easily that, roll that out for an SMB, could easily buy off the shelf. But with Palo Alto, this is more at a very enterprise level. None of this is SMB or, or, or bottoms down focus. So, so obviously, this is two different aspects. Microsoft strategy has been successful in the bottom half of the market, but obviously with where Palo Alto is going is at the very top of the market and obviously comes with significantly much more execution and adoption risk. So it'd be very interesting to see how this works. Uh, obviously, we've made some arguments for why we do think this might work, but I think they're playing the game of like short-term pain for long-term gains because if this does work out well, um, some of the potential um, ARR or like the long-term value you could actually get relative to your CAC uh, could be significantly higher. But again, it's a major gamble um, that they're taking. But I don't know, any final points on your part? And then we'll go through all this Q&A and then add more points. Yeah, I think, I think the only final point I would reiterate or kind of clarify on, you know, the extension of that whole Microsoft idea and into how this plays out is like, Fundamentally, from a strategy perspective, what all of this stuff is about for Palo Alto Networks is getting into platform level transactions where they are selling their customers one or more major parts of the platform in a perfect world, all three, as part of like a major cybersecurity transformation program, as opposed to a more conventional transaction, which is I'm going to compete with Zscaler on SASE. I'm going to compete with CrowdStrike on endpoint detection and response. I'm going to compete with Cisco and Splunk on my SIM and SOC modernization. Like those kinds of negotiations are less favorable because they're highly competitive and they're very isolated. If you can like raise the perspective on all of that and say, I'm just going to sell you this entire 
set of products or at least a major subset of those products in one transaction like it's really hard for even the bigger companies like a zscaler who doesn't really do anything on the security operations side or or you know it just you know name any major public cybersecurity company or startups they don't have like a platform story and so it's really hard for them to compete at that level and so i think like that is that di distinction is very significant if the strategy is going to work for Palo Alto Networks, because if they can elevate to a platform discussion, like they're kind of in a way the only show in town, or at least they're one of a very small handful of companies who can do that. 100%, I agree. And I think, so now just diving in maybe to the Q&A briefly, like again, so one one thing we just mentioned again is Cole has a blog, again, I've, I've put a link to it. I also have a piece as well too, in which you could, you're going to find, we're going to write a lot more about each of these points of it. It's harder to have a conversation, but we'll write more and then ideally maybe publish it by the weekend or thereabouts. Uh, but I want to go to Ben's question in the Q&A. And one of his questions is, how do we evaluate the impact of Palo Alto's earnings on the future of CrowdCheck or Z-Skiller's results and guidance? So if, and I think I've seen some other questions that do point this way. I think a lot of people are trying to interpret like, what does this say for CrowdStrike's earnings in a couple of weeks of Z-Skiller? I think, again, we've just gone over some of the product differences between each of these players. Like for example, CrowdStrike, has a strategy that, that's going down from like the top enterprises down to the lower um, half of the market. And obviously we follow out to their specifically more enterprise focused and just going deeper uh, within that vertical. Another maybe similarity that maybe connects all three of these players, actually Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, and Zscaler, is the reliance on the federal government. So the federal the federal business is a huge um, component actually for Zscaler, um, and that's a huge part of where they drive a lot of their revenues and even a huge part of their competitive advantage is more on the government side. So if this federal issue that it occur uh, with Palo Alto, maybe it's more of a specific Palo Alto issue or they just lost out in a specific deal. So maybe this could, be, this could be a situation whereby this only affects Palo Alto. However, if there's still like there's a backlog or there's something going on with the U.S. federal or in terms of their programming and whatnot, I could see that potentially affecting CrowdStrike's federal business as well as especially more so the Zscaler's federal business, which would probably explain why Zscaler would be down a little bit more um, than, say, CrowdStrike. So, if there's any impact, I could see a lot of this happening to a lot more of these guys. So more on the federal side, and maybe the other side the market could be reading into is just the SASE side. So obviously there were both juggernauts within SASE, within the SASE uh, part of the market for large enterprises. And I could see if there's weakness in that market, that could also be affecting this guy. But I don't think that should be the case. Um, but I don't know if you have any points to add in terms of how you see this um, impact in cross records The The point that the observation that Nikesh raised on the earnings call that I think will be interesting to watch across the other major cybersecurity companies is the he, he, he shared an observation somewhat anecdotally about, you know, observing customers wanting to, I mean, it was perceived as, okay, they're, they're sick of spending on cybersecurity and they want to see more ROI, right? I, I, you know, I would kind of take that as, you know, they, they're acknowledging that they are spending a lot of money on cybersecurity that's going to have to continue, you know, but I, I now care a little bit more about like, what is the ROI that I'm getting on that? Or at least I care about controlling and maximizing the spend instead of just having it be a blank check, right? So I think that's the way that the observation should be interpreted. And it was the first time that this has been raised on their earnings call. So, and 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 I would also add, it was a little more specific of an observation than just general market sluggishness that you hear talked about, you know, broadly from companies that aren't growing as much, right? So I think, I think what will be interesting to watch is among the other high growth companies and relative peers of Palo Alto Networks, are we getting that story corroborated? And is that you know something that we need to then pay attention to? That's such a good point. That whole word around demand fatigue, um, which that he did, it was like a demand fatigue or something like that. So yeah, I think that's going to be something to watch out for with the other companies. But good stuff. Um, CJ, I think we kind of addressed 
this question in and around like the, the midterm slowdown. Um, there's an anonymous who asked about, uh, and Palo Alto's aren't unique in offering product overlapping product by to free transfer programs from another competitor, for example, is this government to do similar things to help this space and consolidate? Yes. Um, I think um, the anonymous question there around Zisco and Netscope doing very similar things. I think they're actually seeing some of that. Actually, I, I read a note from a particular bank before this saying that when Nikesh on the call referred to as like rogue, we're seeing rogue things happening on the market. Like some of our competitors are doing rogue things. I think this is actually, I think this might actually be one of the reasons propelling this some of some of the strategies, I think existing vendors, we don't know who, but like are using very aggressive pricing strategies. And so, yes, some of this aggressive strategy isn't necessarily new, maybe not at a grand scale at which Palo Alto is wanting to do it, but I think some of this does exist. Um, anything you add there, Cool. Yeah, I mean, thanks for sharing the examples. I mean, having a, I still think this is a relatively new ish thing, right? Like we're in general, we're used to seeing the the the, the problems that we talked about earlier of having to pay dual, dual licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's by far how most security software gets sold. I, I think the important distinction though is even if it doesn't mean, like these competitors are other ones, right? Zscale or Netscope, others, right? Like in 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 that case, they're 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 making a competing offer on one part of Palo, Palo Alto Network's platform, right? Like those are SASE companies that's only in SASE, right? Like the difference between Palo Alto Networks is they're making a much broader and much more high level offer to say, hey, like we're not only gonna do this for your SASE, we're gonna do this across your security operations, your cloud security, your network security, and all the domains that we play in if you want it, right? Like that is a completely different level of offer than it is to make it in one domain yes absolutely it's such a yes uh, it, it's a good point um cool uh we have another one of the most question here that was just about Palo Alto's product and how ai how some of the ai capabilities would increase revenue um i, I think we briefly differentiated just between like ai and, and, and some of that i mean one thing we probably need to talk about is over time probably over the next three to five years the, with the with more adoption of generative AI within the enterprise, that would increase a lot more network traffic because there's a lot like data and data packet requests coming in and out of an organization that has to go through a potential firewall to inspect that or through a SASE type type of buffer. So they have talked about this, and even Fortinet has mentioned this, that obviously the increased use of AI in general would increase network traffic. And I so you could see some potential tailwinds um driving some growth in 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 the SaaS and network security business. And obviously their XIM product, which they're betting on, a lot more automation, automating lots of really manual tasks that security professionals have to do. Um with like this XIM and SIM type of product, you could see some of that potential playing a role. And then I think down the road, you shouldn't like similar to how price right has shallow AI which is like a, a chatbot specifically for SOC analysts. I think we shouldn't be surprised if Palo Alto does announce something quite similar to that over the long run. So I wouldn't be surprised, but those are some ways in which you could see AI like driving growth for them. Um, cool, cool. Um, Chris had a question here, and I think we kind of answered this, but like, how do we see Palo Alto's competition with CrowdStrike playing over the next quarter? Yeah, again, I, we could I, again maybe one thing and of course if you have any other things to ask specific you know Palo Alto and CrowdStrike but maybe mostly from the product side, especially for next quarter. One thing I maybe didn't talk about is obviously CrowdStrike has a lot more sim like types of products. Um, so S I E M, and obviously some components of E D R. ADR and XDR, specifically maybe more XDR, that does compete with Palo Alto's XIM product suite. So you could see some of that playing out, as well as on the cloud security side. So obviously, CrowdStrike is the second or third largest cloud security player on, on the market, right behind Wiz and um, Palo Alto Network. So I could, you could see some competition happening more on the cloud security business, as well as on the SIM slash XDR product suite. But it's very hard to like tactically decide how that might actually play out over the next quarter. But yes, they're probably competing in a lot more products. 
Any yeah, I mean, I think I think there's some degree of like coopetition that has to happen here. I mean, yes, they're competing, but like there there are some adjacencies despite the overlap as well. Like, and I think a good example, Nikesh didn't specifically name it, but I think you could infer that this is who he was talking about on the earnings call. Of you know, basically he was talking about XIM adoption, right? And in 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 a perfect world, the way that it would work for Palo Alto Networks is their endpoint security product would get deployed, and that would be part of the sensors that would ingest data. Data from endpoints back into XSIM, right? But what he mentioned on the call was it, essentially not so many words, like the customer had a product that was probably CrowdStrike, they wanted to keep it. And so what they had to do was integrate with that product, that endpoint product, instead of replacing it. Like they're gonna have to do that. I mean, CrowdStrike does have a meaningful, you know, double digit percentage of that particular market. And so I don't think that it's realistic to just say, oh, we're gonna displace CrowdStrike or, or Sentinel or name your favorite, you know, large market share EDR, uh, EDR product in the near term. It's just not gonna happen. 100%, I agree. Uh, cool, great. Um, I think we Ben's question around strategy and business differences between Zscaler and Palo Alto Networks. Um, again, I think we've touched on that. Like we, we talked about some of the similarities, obviously they both rely heavily on the government and federal um, for growth. They both compete very well on the network security side. Again, I highly recommend any of you I, I do have a cybersecurity bootcamp where I really go in depth with the differences between these players. Um, again, so one about the similarities that the federal reliance, they were both network security and they do compete very well on the SASE product suite. Obviously, things like OT security are emerging new areas for both players. Um, obviously on SSC, they do they do compete on they're, they're both competitors within that category as well. Um, but beyond that, like I don't know, it'd be very interesting to see how this plays out. But but yes, there are Zscaler doesn't have any hardware or firewall appliance, so it doesn't even rely on that for, for revenue at all. Palo Alto still relies not as much, but still has a decent chunk um within hardware firewalls that they do rely for business growth. And obviously both companies are both very enterprise focused. But uh, but yes, I I don't know how it would concretely play out, but I'd be interested to see what that happens over the next few quarters. Okay, cool. Um, let's go to Fernando's question here about like even what to what extent do we expect the strategy of optimization changes the very nature of competition away from cross-strike Ziscular and more into Microsoft, AVG or Broadcom as well as potential Cisco. I mean, I think you might have some points here, and I'm happy to chime in. Yeah, Fernando's the professional industry analyst. Oh, yes. So, yeah, he's, really good question. He's questions the guy. That I he's uh, so I, I, I think it's really, I, to kind of take a step back on the question, it's basically like, you know, even the major cybersecurity players that kind of have relatively large platforms and revenue, CrowdStrike, Zscaler, you know, Palo Alto, et cetera, you know, are we going to see this whole notion of platformization kind of push even further up market into broader tech companies like Microsoft, Broadcom, and Cisco, who, you know, are multi, multi-billion dollar revenue companies with, you know, of which cybersecurity is a big, but not like, you know, 100% of their business and even below 50%, like doesn't even get pushed up to that level. I, I, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think we're going to find out because all of these companies, especially Broadcom and especially Cisco, are spending double digit billions of dollars in some of the largest transactions in cybersecurity history to build out their platforms. So it's 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 definitely the experiment is coming. Um, you know, I, I think it comes back to the point I was making earlier around how effectively the platform is built from an underlying technology standpoint and do customers actually want it. Right. Like that's that's where it really matters, because I, you know, if, if Palo Alto Networks executes successfully from a product perspective and actually does, you know, stitch together platforms that cover, you know, three or four of the major domains in cybersecurity, like that's very compelling. Like people are going to want that versus, you know, if it, I think especially like Broadcom and Cisco are probably the ones to call out a little bit more specifically. Right now, those look a little bit more like consolidation plays, right? Where they've they've just acquired a lot of tech, of which may or may not work well together, right? And so I think if that's as far as they get with it, 
it's it's not as compelling because you still have to spend a lot of money on system integrators or spend your own time to get all that to work together well, and it may still not be as effective. And so I, I think that's like ultimately what's going to drive out how this plays out is how well does the platform actually work. Yes, I, I, I do agree. So yes, it would be very interesting. And, and honestly, I think a lot of those guys have a lot more to worry in terms of how they integrate multiple products. And a lot of their, the nature of their acquisition from Cisco and AVG are usually significantly much bigger. Um, and so there's a lot more work to see. But I think you answered that well. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, maybe we Ryan's question. Um, so I, I think, I think with that one, um. I mean, Ryan, feel free to like maybe put the question in the game, like and like specifically what you want us to answer there. But th there are quite a lot of points there that maybe hard to grind. But in the meantime, let's go to Art's question. I can try. Actually, I can try. You I kind of read it. Sure. Quick. Uh, I, I, I'm glad the cash isn't on because I don't think he would agree at all. Uh, so I'm kind. Of, I'll kind of try to like bridge the gap there, knowing like where he stands, because this this is essentially like several of the contentious analyst points all in one question right so it's the, the contentious parts are like rev you know or demand is actually falling and there and then price wars are occurring you know within that and then you know therefore like this platformization strategy in particular the pricing incentive program is around like trying to you know ram product down their throat like i i don't know about that i i understand how you could interpret it that way or not, I'm not referring to Ryan specifically. I mean, it's just, there's there's a lot of people that hold this opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Like I could understand how it would be interpreted that way. You know, I I, I kind of do believe Nikesh in saying like, there isn't a meaningful drop in demand for cybersecurity spend. And I think if you were to look at like, like Francis actually wrote like a pretty amazing article recently that, you know, it wasn't original research, but it was like a meta level research that just stitched together a whole bunch of pricing data or a whole bunch of like spend data from multiple different surveys that were all done recently and kind of corroborated all of it, right? And I think if you, to the extent that you can rely on that, which is multiple surveys, so I think it's reasonably reliable or at least as reliable as you can find in public, I, I don't think that there's any, any, any direct evidence of like meaningful reduction in cybersecurity spend, right? So I believe them in like the demand is there. Right. The the pricing, the price war thing, you know, I, I think that Nikesh even referred to that himself, right? Where that was the whole rogue behavior and irrational behavior happening from legacy vendors who don't want to displace. Like, sure, that's gonna happen. I mean, that, that happens all the time. That's a that's a story as end, as old as time where in, in enterprise purchasing where the legacy, you know, or incumbent, whether, whether the legacy or not, vendors don't want to get displaced. Like they, it's hard to make an enterprise sale. And so once you've made that sale, you don't want to get out of it. <laughs> or or if you're if you're clearly not going to win on product or some other dimension that you would prefer to win on, some people resort to winning on price and then raise the price later. Like this is not unique to the time that we're in. This has happened forever. And so, you know, I, I sure that exists, but I think, you know, Nikesh's point is we're trying to get out of that game. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, and, then, and then I think that kind of addresses the last point, which is like, I, I do not take the whole pricing program as, you know, we're just going to slash prices and shove this down people's throats. I take it as like, let's get a backlog of stuff that may not have happened for three years, four years, five years, because inertia is the power of force and enterprises don't move quickly. Like, let's just accept that that's going to happen and get rid of any possible barrier that we can to get that to move forward. Like, I think that's good for everybody. I think that's as much of a win-win situation as you can possibly get when you're talking about enterprise software buying. So I, I don't know. I think it's great. 100%. No, I agree. And then on, on the point about demand, I've, I've looked at lots of really lots of survey work over Q4 last year. And like some data is going to be coming in for even Q1 of this year. But consistently, and I was going to notice this so called everyone's saying their cybersecurity budgets are increasing coming into 24. Like it's not shrinking at the most. Some enterprises are like, it's pretty much maybe flat or like we're just keeping it pretty even. So there isn't a demand problem. Um, I, I think it's just, it just all of it just comes down to like vendors. Though a lot of this survey, one thing was very consensus among that was companies are saying, we're trying to get more for what we have. We want to get more from what we have. And I think that was that whole comment around demand fatigue. So I think, yeah, so I think it's it's a lot more, it's a very 
how are the um, specific things and like how, how they're managing to win deals and, and contracts. So, okay, good stuff. Um, Art had this question around like market share and like, I think to Art's question is like, do we have any evidence to support that this is work going to work? And like, maybe does um Microsoft put, give a, a good precedent to this? Um, do you want to maybe take that on first, and then I I, I can finish up maybe the Microsoft part or? Yeah, sorry, this was our this was Art's question. I, this is Art's know. question. Yeah, because. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think referring back again to Francis's you know meta research around market share or around it, it was his was around purchasing you know like purchasing decisions and like budget surveys basically like CISO is your budget going up and down right? I, I think that's a reasonable proxy for measuring like is is the actual size of the market, you know, getting bigger or smaller. So I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say like, yes, cybersecurity budgets are still going up because in, in any one of those surveys, you still see double digit percentages of people saying, yes, my budget's going up. Um, you know, I like, I, again, I think, I think what it's, I'm trying to reconcile this with the Microsoft part. Um, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I think Microsoft's probably like the best comp for this whole platformization play, I would probably still argue that Microsoft is a little bit more of a bundle than it is a platform, you know, and that's where we refer exactly. to this whole, you know, E5 licensing bid and sort of how they can like creatively, you know, raise and sell and in some cases even give things away for free in order to sell the entire bundle. Like, I, I, I think I think it's going to be interesting to see somebody not Microsoft get in the game on like a similar strategy, right? I, I I would add though, or I would caveat it by saying like that that comparison got brought up on the earnings call and Nikesh was like a little reluctant to embrace it. I mean, he he didn't reject it, but he also didn't say, yes, we're doing the Microsoft strategy. Like I would take it as this is our Palo Alto Networks flavored version of all this, of which he calls platformization. You know, but they're they're not exactly the same. There are nuances between them, and so you know, I think it'll be really interesting to see like how this actually plays out. You know, quarter over quarter. I agree, and and one last point too, and I think people have to realize with licensing and bundling and how Microsoft has done it, this is a lot more with SMB, and this is a lot more with people who are like fairly have very little budgets. But this is but with my power out the strategy to lot more at the largest enterprise. Microsoft doesn't have a lot of like products in the network security suite or firewall or like SASE. And those are usually where there's significantly large budgets, significantly longer implementation timelines to actually execute a lot of those. It's 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 just it's actually a very different strategy. But yes, this idea of like bundling or like okay, we're gonna platformize you under one umbrella, like network or like standardized on cloud security uh, are fairly so, But time will tell um, to see how well that works out. Uh, Nippon's question here was just more like the macro impact on cyber historic market, as I don't see a lot of red and blue chip stocks down, but like obviously the security names are down. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, we've maybe talked a little bit about why some of some of the stocks are down, and I was maybe going over some of the differences between this Palo Palo Alto, um, set no one and CrowdStrike. But again, I think you're going to see more impact to Zscaler, um, because there are a lot more similarities between Zscaler and Palo Alto in some areas, not everything, um, relative to say CrowdStrike, uh, or even set no one. So, but yeah, they, they might have just done the market a huge favor <laughs> inadvertently just by timing of their earnings announcement being sooner. Like, I think they've now set the bar really low. Not, and I don't mean that as an insult to Palo Alto. I just mean like expectations are now in check <laughs> compared to That's prior right. quarter. And so, you know, I, I think what that means is like, if those other companies, you know, are also in a similar situation where, you know, they're going to have to lower guidance, it's going to be less of a hit later. Like they're kind of just taking the hit up front. Right. And then, or then if they do actually have a better story and they come out, you know, sort of neutral or better, you know, they might see a disproportionate gain back. And I think, I think Paul also could benefit the other way around too, where they may see a bit of an uptick by, you know, investors observing that it's not the entire market that's taking a hit. Yeah, absolutely. So um to Parker's question, so I've heard that Palo Alto feels feels fairly cobbled together as opposed to a true seamless integrated platform, and that is their sticky and that is their sticky firewall that keeps customers from switching a painful replacement. 
However, a sassy moves firewall to the cloud. I'm wondering if this would allow customers to unbundle Palado. In other words, it feels like the keystone in keeping customers is the firewall. And I'm looking for a catalyst that allows customers um churn. Um you you want to talk to some of these first and I could like yeah. I could chime in. Couple couple parts going on. I think this is a it's really astute. Uh, observation and astute like question. I, I I think we can do our best to try to answer it, but I mean ultimately this is like a time will tell thing. Um, I I think what I would say about the cobbling piece is like, you know, I I, I don't think that by us talking about platformization we meant to imply that it it is perfectly working together and like this is a Steve Jobs Apple like it just works thing. Like I have no doubt that that's the case. I mean they just acquire enough companies and the technology is broad enough and complex enough that I am sure that there are like rough edges within, you know, within the product. Right. But I would sort of counter that by saying there, it's not like there's somebody else sitting on the market that does have a perfectly polished product that's all stitched together. Right. So I think, you know, from a buyer's perspective or a practitioner perspective, your alternatives are, you know, I'll take a, semi-stitched Palo Alto Networks product that's getting more and more stitched by the day. Like they're, they're, they're integrating it further and further over time. Or you're in like a roll my own situation of I'm just going to buy the best of breed and I'm going to do the stitching myself, right? So e either way, like you're in a situation where it's not perfect. I think that's, again, why I keep harping on the like it comes a lot of this comes down to product execution for Palo Alto Networks. Like they have to deliver on on building like the integrated platform and getting, you know, getting things to at least an acceptable, if not beyond acceptable level of integration. Um, as far as the firewall thing goes, like. I think it's interesting. Nikesh kind of talked about this. Like, I think it's an interesting observation, or he had an inter interesting observation that's like relevant to their hardware business. He made the prediction that, you know, especially in large enterprises, the future of SASE and the future of network security is still going to involve a hardware component. Like it's just going to be hardware plus software, right? And his his point was we have a really good story around that. And I, I think I agree. I mean, they do have a very strong you know, hardware portfolio, but they also have a very strong software portfolio and the revenue supports that because it's like roughly 50-50, roughly right? So, you know, I, I think at least for like the largest customers, I, I don't, you know, are things moving to the cloud? Yes, but are are you going to see like a majority of, of global 2000 companies go fully cloud, you know, with their network? Like, no, it's not going to happen. So I do think there is going to be a hardware component for a while and that advantage is going to matter, right? I, I, you know, smaller markets, I'm not sure. I definitely think that's possible that it's pretty compelling to have a full, you know, full blown cloud story. But I think ultimately the question around it is just like, how well, you know, how well does, how much does it matter that having good software and good hardware, you know, is, is a differentiator? I mean, that's, that's the part that we'll see on. And one thing I'll really mention, I think it's very important for people to know is they said 30, greater than 30, over 30% 30 of net new customers to their SaaS this quarter were like completely net new customers. Like these are just net new total customers, not like out of their existing base that came in and adopted their SaaS platform, which is a cloud focused product. I think that that shows that's a big sign that like customers truly believe in the product. Um, it's for them to get like especially net new customers coming onto their cloud delivered um SaaS, and that that shows they're probably winning some deals against the some of the best of breed likes like Zscaler and the likes. So equally, they do have a really good SaaS product. Um, that's like relatively independent of the firewall as well. Well, they could still win deals. Um, independent of that. So just yeah, just 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 wanted to talk about that. Okay, uh, we got one more. I think we got two more questions here, and then we'll maybe just wrap it up. Um, so the anonymous attendee just had. Um, I've done a lot of work with Cato Networks, and I'm curious how do you see the following: true single vendor SASE, Cato versus SASE, Alonto true M and A versus best of breed SASE plus SSE, like Zscaler plus other SB one, for example. So. So how how do we see the differences between this truth vendor like um type of solution? I'm, I'm happy to go take take that one, take a crack at it. Like again, like so Cato Networks, I, I think a lot of people know, but like obviously they started out more on the SSC um side of things. Um and then obviously eventually eventually moved on to SD1 um and incorporated that component. 
Palo Alto specifically started up obviously as a really as a firewall vendor and SD WAN type of player, and then obviously over time incorporated more of the SSC components to it, and then. Obviously, like, like Fortinet, for example, same thing. They're extremely good on the networking side. Um, and now they're adopting some of the more cloud-based um, SSC component. Um, I, I think right now, and then obviously Zscaler is always cloud-delivered SSC. And then I think now they're maybe incorporating some element of sd one or some parts of the networking component. But I think they were very much sold on more being SSC. I think maybe just because that would be very technical. And again, I have a I've done a deep dive on this for anyone who wants to read like the real differences between SSC versus SASE and SD WAN. But one thing I'll just say is um I think this only matters in terms of the types of customers they're going to. So if you're going to a, like a financial, an insurance, a highly regulated um client to a large enterprise that has a hybrid um, uh, deployment work so that way they have lots of on-prem presence as well as they have a cloud deliver presence. A lot of those customers would always lean more to a vendor that has a true, um, that, that has a single Stasi vendor-like solution. That means a component of SD1 networking side as well as like an SSC component. You're gonna win those types of deals easily. So, with customers that are more highly regulated with an on-prem presence, the likes of Fortinet, Palo Alto, they, they have a lot more of an advantage within those types of customers. Um, and maybe in some cases, um, Cato Networks as well. Meanwhile, a very purely cloud-based enterprise or large enterprise would lean more to like a Zscaler or like a Netscope like type of player. So that's maybe one difference in which like you could see these players winning deals. But again, there's a lot of nuance because like someone like Zscaler generates a huge part of their revenue from the federal and like they have this federal status that gives them a significant advantage. So there's lots of nuance, but that's the difference that I'll give for anyone is thinking through the types of customer tell. Um, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I think fundamentally the difference here is not like which of the three flavors mentioned here of SASE do you prefer? It's a question of does the security buyer want to procure SASE only or do they want to procure SASE plus security operations plus cloud security plus yeah, everything that Palo Alto offers, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like ultimately that it's it's more of a platform versus, you know, not that it's it's hard for me to say SASE is like a point solution because it's really broad, but like, you, you know, it's, it's like, do I want a really broad security platform or do I want, you know, kind of like, that the, the, that type of SASE offering. I mean, that's that's like fundamentally what Palo Alto Networks is getting at here is like, they're trying to flip the script on that where it becomes more of a conversation around, I want a security platform. Because if you look at any of the companies that are in there, like, you know, Cato, Zscaler, um, et cetera, like th they have no answer to the platform side. Like they literally don't make, uh, they don't have products in security operations or the other or cloud security or like other domains that Palo Alto network can put together in their platform. And so it's a completely different conversation. Like there is no conversation at that point if that's what the buyer wants. Exactly, exactly. No, and that that's this is where Palo Alto does have a major edge is um customers could say, hey, we could help we could help you standardize on some of these other components as well. But good stuff. Um last point here is just Roger's question. A large percent of enterprise customers remain believers in the too many eggs in one basket philosophy. I think consolidation enterprise market is not a straightforward topic. Um, do, do you have do you have perspective on that? Yeah, I I, I get I get it. I mean, I've heard that before. I I have sort of observed that before. I I think that's more security lore than it is fact. I mean, I I it, it, that so that's one thing is I'm not even I'm not even totally sure how true that is amongst at least not amongst like a majority of actual you know cybersecurity practitioner leaders and executives um I, and, and i think the other point which is probably more relevant i mean not to be dismissive of the observation like 
I, I would also say that like the CISO is not the only one who has a vote here, right? And, and I think that's kind of like the point Nikesh was making around wanting to see more ROI and more, you know, kind of standardization across the transaction for security products. Like the CFO gets a vote, procurement gets a vote, and guess what? They're really powerful people. Like they're probably more powerful than the CISO in almost every organization, for sure the CFO is, right? And so if the CFO says, hey, I want to see you working with fewer vendors and I want to see you kind of get more out of this and, 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 and show me a, a reduction in spend or at least like a management in spend or, you know, reduce the, do the things we catch talks about, like reduce the execution risk. I don't want you to spend as much on services or I don't want you to pay double licenses. Like when you have to, when you're an executive that has to deal with those kinds of problems, it makes this platformization situation a whole lot more appealing. You care a lot less about are my eggs in one basket or not. Exactly, exactly. No, I do agree. And and honestly, like, um, consolidation in enterprise market, like, yeah, it's not as straightforward. There's there's just a lot of nuances from pricing to implementation to integration. Um, there's there's a lot more that goes in into it. Together, with the points that you've mentioned as well. So, so but but yes, there, there's two sides to this argument in gen in in general. But anyway, and, and I think it's too like let's 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 be careful about not taking it to an extreme, right? Like you know, I, I've talked about consolidation a lot, both on this webinar and you know on social media and articles and whatever. But like it, it, it's it's not like an and or thing. It's not like every it's going to be fully consolidated and like every enterprise is only going to buy every piece of cybersecurity software from Palo Alto Networks. Like I'm pretty sure that Nikesh would even say that that's never going to happen. <laughs> like even if he would want it to, it's just not going to happen. It's not realistic in the dynamic industry that we live in. Like it's a spectrum. What's going to happen, like what you also don't want is I have one vendor for every single unique security need that I have, right? The question is just like, where do we land on that? That spectrum and even that answer isn't like a one size fits all answer like some companies are going to want to land more on the consolidated set the consolidated side of the spectrum and others aren't going to care as much and they're going to want to buy from you know they don't mind managing vendors so it, it's a, it's a That's very true. fluid situation but it's never going to end up at either one of the extremes yes and i think we saw there was a survey from etr that actually showed the number of people who actually want consolidated product like necessarily considered has reduced from like say where that was in 2023 relative to where it is right now. So yes, there are some cost there's there are every enterprise is different. You can't just use that same post bucket for everyone. Um anyways, but in general, I, I think in general, thank you very much everyone for joining us. Like obviously we went a little over apologies for the glitches that we have with the Zoom um initially, but thank you all for your participation. Again, we're we're gonna have a lot more to write about this over the next coming days. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna share both of our um, blogs on here, but feel free to check them out. Again, Paul has strategy of security. Uh, if you Google it, you're, you're gonna easily find it anywhere you want. Um, on my part, I have the software analyst piece um, where if you have any questions, you could always reach out to me on there um, or Twitter or LinkedIn. And then I also have a cybersecurity bootcamp. I know we talked about lots of cybersecurity terminologies. That's the SB1. Apologies for like for, for all of this, but if you want to go back into like just the basics of understanding how each of those components, or even like differences between Palo Alto versus Zisco versus CrowdStrike, um, I we have a cybersecurity bootcamp that like goes in depth into all of these differences. And actually, we have a discount going on now uh, for twenty percent. Um, between now and like um the, the weekend so check that out in the, in the book camp but without further ado yeah thank you very much everyone for joining us and um and yes we'll, we'll see you guys on the other side thank you thank you